Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today's video we are going to be talking about my favorite books of 2020. I've been so excited for this video, especially in the past recent months because 2020 has been such a excellent reading year. So before we get started in my favorite books of 2020, I wanted to share with you guys my reading stats. These are all stats that I got off of Goodreads. This year I read 72 books, so I accomplished my reading goal of 50 books that I set out to accomplish at the beginning of this year. I read 24,936 pages. The shortest book that I read this year was The Pride Proudest Blue by Ibtimhaj Muhammad. This was a picture book. I just read it because I wanted to support my Muslim sisters in the community. The longest book that I read this year was A Promised Land by Barack Obama. The average book length that I read this year was 345 pages. I'm not surprised. Usually 300 pages is my target range. The most popular book that I read this year was Pride and Prejudice. I read this for my senior year, um, my my AP literature class we had to read this. My least popular book that I read this year was Letters to the Person I Was. This is like a poetry collection by an indie publisher so that makes perfect sense. And then the average star rating that I gave for all the books that I read this year was 4.4 stars which is magical. Comment down below how many books you guys read this year and also comment down below what was your number one favorite book of this year. I want to see if we have any in common and maybe get some recommendations for 2021. Let's go ahead and get started. I ranked the books starting at 15. I'm going to be sharing 15 books that I read this year because I feel like 21 would have been way too much to make it a favorites list. All of these books that I have to share with you guys today are all books that I rated a 5 out of 5 stars and I really just wanted to strictly keep it to that. So coming in at number 15 I have Cinderella is Dead by Kaylin Bayron. This book is a retelling of Cinderella but it takes place 200 years after the original fairy tale. It takes place in a world where a oppressive laws are based on the success story of Cinderella. So teen girls are forced to attend this annual ball where men select their wives and if a girl is not chosen by her second ball she disappears. Our main character Sophia is in love with her best friend and so she decides that instead of going to a ball she would much rather risk her life and try and escape this little like village kingdom town. It's really really good. It's a fantasy standalone and it's really short so I think it's a great book to read during a readathon. The writing was really really good and I just felt like the overall story was very entertaining, refreshing, and I think it was a great retelling. Coming in at number 14 is Tiny Pretty Things by Danielle Clayton. You guys might recognize this because recently Netflix released a Netflix original series based on these books, which as soon as I heard that that was being announced, I was so excited. I read these books before the show came out. I haven't seen the show yet, but I want to watch it sometime soon with my sisters. I've been kind of putting it off because I love this duology so much and I really don't want the show to ruin it for me, but I have a good feeling about the show. This book is like what I would describe as Black Swan meets Pretty Little Liars. It takes place in my favorite city in the world, New York, and it follows a mix of characters that all attend this elite ballet school. All of these different characters are obsessed and willing to do anything to become the prima ballerina or in other words just number one top of the school. It's really dark. There's actually a sequel called Shiny Broken Pieces which I also read this year and was also a favorite of mine and so what I love about these books are they're just so dark and atmospheric and entertaining and they're so good. I also love that they're just kind of the perfect language both of the books are really really short so I'm really excited to see what Netflix does to kind of adapt it. Coming in at number 13 is going to be a sequel this year and that is Children of Virtue and Vengeance by Tomi Adeyemi. I read this kind of at the beginning of this year and this is the sequel to Children of Blood and Bone that came out in 2018. That book I feel like was such a huge hit in 2018. This series is kind of about this world called Orisha that's very heavily inspired by Nigerian mythology which I can 
can always appreciate as someone who is from Africa. I'm West African, so I love just having a fantasy world based on more African elements. A lot of people like to describe this series as Black Panther meets Avatar The Last Airbender, and I definitely think that's the case more for the first book. So the setup of the series does kind of have different characters that mirror Avatar The Last Airbender, and there are definitely allegorical elements in the first book that I think mirror Avatar The Last Airbender, but I think as the book the books go on this is like its own series so the main premise is that we have this cast of characters that are essentially trying to bring back magic to Arisha and in the world of Arisha people that tend to wield mag magic are called the magi and they're kind of the oppressed cast in this world they also tend to be more darker skinned so you see the concept of racism addressed in a fantastical element and in Tomi's author's note of the first book she kind of talks talks about how Black Lives Matter does play a part into this fantastical world. So the characters are just super complex and you deal with a lot of themes of like war and heartbreak and family and loss and love and I love all of that and how that's all woven together and I think the writing is so beautiful and I just get so swept up into this world. It's just one of those like fantasy books that remind me of like why I love to read and why fantasy is one of my favorite genres ever and I just can't wait to see what Tomi does with this series. Number 12 was the last book that I completed in 2020 and that was American Dirt. I talked about this book a lot in my last reading vlog of the year which if you guys haven't seen that vlog go check it out. This book is about immigration and I'm really really interested in immigration which is why I originally picked this book up. It's really just about the struggles and the sacrifices and the the challenges of immigration and sometimes even the necessity of immigration. This this book is about Lydia. She owns a bookstore in Mexico City and she has an eight-year-old son and a husband that is a journalist. When her husband publishes a tell-all article about the leader of a drug cartel in her neighborhood, 16 of her family members are killed at the beginning of the book. And so Lydia and her son basically become the main target of this drug cartel and it becomes unsafe for them to live in Mexico City. Fearing for their lives, Lydia packs up what little she has left of her life in the brink of this tragedy and she's forced to run thousands of thousands of miles up north to kind of es escape this life where she is constantly fearing for her own safety and the safety of her child. There's a lot of heartbreak and along the way she meets other immigrants who have even more heartbreaking stories and just you see how immigration is not black and white and you see how immigration is sometimes a means of of, of survival for a lot of people and so it's definitely something that needs to be just handled and it kind of brings into the whole discussion of immigration and politics today and it's such a heartbreaking story but I also think that it is such a well-written book. The writing in this book is literal magic. I'm like not even exaggerating here. It is so so good. It has a lot of really just powerful Spanish quotes embedded in it and so that's why I personally appreciated listening to the audiobook because the narrator spoke Spanish in the book and I like that whole aspect of it. And what I really just took and appreciated from this book was the whole discussion of immigration from a voice that I feel like is just so so underrepresented. So I think this book is so so important and this story just needs to be heard. One of my favorite lines from the book that I wanted to share with you guys is the quote, on this side too there are dreams. I just, there were so many one-liners in this book that I was like, oh my god literally loved it I, I'm obsessed with this book it's definitely a lifetime favorite and I think that it just left me so touched by the end of it coming in at number 11 I have a middle grade book and that is other words for home I talked about this a lot when I read it I knew immediately when I read it that it was definitely going to be a favorite of the year this book is a book told in verse which I always appreciate I love poetry and it's a middle grade book and it's a story about this 11 year old girl Judah was born in Syria and at the beginning of the story her and her mother are forced to separate from her brother and father because of a war in Syria so they end up having to come to America and leaving behind everything they knew. This is after growing up watching you know the movies American movies and get, becoming fascinated with the whole idea of America and the glamorized idea of the American dream and you know Hollywood and all of those classic American propaganda that you see in like movies.
movies and things. America is not as glamorous as it seems. What you really see is that Judah experiences a difficult transition just because of a lot of things that are going on in her life. She's obviously starting a new school in a completely different country. She's transitioning towards, you know, learning English. As she's going through all of this, she's learning all of the implications of what it means to be Middle Eastern in a post 9-11 America. She deals with all of this while coming to, of age herself and dealing with those like whole coming of age struggles. So it's a coming of age story, but with all these background complexities going on. And at the end of the day, all Judah wants to do is just make new friends and land a role in the school musical. So it's such a beautiful story. It has such great writing. As I said, it was a book in verse, written in verse, and I think it, that was like the perfect format for it. And reading it, I just felt like I related so much to this story. And it was definitely a book that I wish that I had when I was younger and in this stage of life. So coming in at number 10, I have Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. Are you guys surprised? I mean, come on. Elizabeth Acevedo released a book in 2020. It's gonna end up on my favorite books of the year list. So Clap When You Land is another book told in verse. I kind of look at Clap When You Land as kind of almost like a mix of the Poetics and With the Fire on High, her other two books that she's released. What I love about Elizabeth Acevedo just in general terms is she's Dominican and I love how she talks about her experiences and her background of Dominican in like every book that she publishes. This book is really about grief, it's about devastation, it's about love, it's about the challenge and learning how to forgive and it's about what happens when you learn these secrets about a family member that has died. Like how do you even deal with that? How do you forgive someone that you find has done these things, has this whole secret life when they're dead. So this book follows two girls. The first girl is named Camino and she lives in the Dominican Republic. Every year she looks forward to the summertime because it's when her father comes home and visits her and one summer she goes to pick up her father at the airport and she finds everyone crying and learned that there has been an accident and her dad has passed away in a plane crash. The other girl that we follow is named Yahaira. She lives in New York. She's at school chilling one day and she gets called to the principal's office and finds out that her dad has also died in the same plane crash going from New York to the Dominican Republic. And so both girls are faced with this horrible horrible tragedy but then they're also faced with finding out the secrets that their father has kept from them and it all just kind of unravels. It's a book that you can read in one sitting because it's told in verse and I think that's one of the reasons why I like verse. Not only can you like really consume a very complex story or idea very quickly but I think it also just is a, a unique way of telling a story and I think it's a it's it's a way of telling a story where that can sometimes bring more of the emotion into it. I don't know how to explain it but it is so good. Listen to this on audiobook if you are into audiobooks because this one on audiobook is actually narrated by Elizabeth Osfito. All her books are narrated by her and I think she does a great job of kind of performing and bringing this story to life because she knows it. She knows the ins and outs of it and she wrote it and it is excellent. It is so so good. Trust me on that. Coming in at number nine I have a Philippa Gregory book and it is called The Taming of the Queen. The Taming of the Queen is about Henry VIII's last wife. It is a part of the Tudor Court series which follows a bunch of Henry VIII's wives and all these other iconic women in medieval English history. It sounds boring but it's really just her books are basically historical dramas. They like to take a focus on powerful women that are that are kind of iconic in history but also women that are not as popular as not are not as focused on in history but have a lot to them and I really like that Philippa Gregory does that. So this book I feel like is another instance where we have this queen who managed to survive Henry VIII. Somehow she outlived him and there's really not much that you know you learn about in history about her. Like when I took Euro she was just kind of one of Henry VIII's wives. This follows Catherine de Par. At the beginning of the story she marries Henry when she's a 30 year old widow and this story is really just the story of a survivor. What I love about this series in general is that Philippa Gregory does not sugarcoat Henry the 
28th. He was an abuser. He was a wife killer. Let's just get it straight. Yes, he did amazing things for the world and for England and all of that, but he wasn't this glorious king who could only do good. So basically, the story is the story of a woman who really just longed for passion, power, and education. And it's kind of the story of her dealing with all of that, dealing with her love of these things, her passion for more, to learn more, to become educated, and to become educated as a woman in this medieval court run by a killer. The reason why this book is called The Taming of the Queen is it's the story of Catherine de Parr going from a young woman who is full of passion, full of naivete, to a woman who has to tame herself because she has to survive this husband that has a track record for killing, divorcing, beheading, all of the above his past wives. She becomes self-educated and she becomes super independent and then she learns that that can be weaponized against herself and so she has to hide these best parts of herself. She has to hide her passion and her, her desire to just become independent in this court and I, I loved all of that. I love the complexity of that story. I love seeing her grow as a person across the span of this entire book and I just got so invested in her story. This book very much reminded me of The King's Curse by Philippa Gregory. It was about Margaret de la Pole, kind of a character in that family that I feel like was kind of more in the background, but you see her develop and you see her grow and you see her power in hiding herself and taming herself down. And I think Philippa Gregory does such a such an excellent job of telling the story of all these different women in history. Coming in at number eight, I have The Dark Descent of Elizabeth Frankenstein by Kirsten White. I read this back in the fall. I did like a cozy fall reading vlog. Definitely go check out that reading vlog if you want to hear my in the moment thoughts. This is a retelling of Frankenstein, a story that I haven't read yet, but I am interested to read because I think that this book really got me thinking a lot. But it's basically Frankenstein told through the perspective of Elizabeth. As a child, her foster mother sells her to this rich Frankenstein family. They essentially take her in with the sole purpose of having her socialize their kind of socially awkward son Victor. And Victor has this weird propensity for darkness. He's obviously kind of like the doctor in Frankenstein and he ends up creating you know a monster essentially. But she kind of spends her whole life and she learns to gain self-worth from what she can do to serve this family. And so her happiness is really much very much tied to another person's happiness. So you kind of see how that can become a tricky game and how it's so so important to find your purpose in life and your happiness and your self-worth in your own self and not in someone else's because you start to really lose yourself along the way and you see how she loses herself and loses her morality basically getting swept up into this dark game with Victor and it's a dark book and it's perfect to read around the Halloween spooky season. So if you haven't read this, I really recommend that you pick it up around fall time next year. I think it is so, so good. It's also really short, so it's not going to take you too, too long. And there's just like a lot of questions of morality that this book really brings up that I think is inspired by the original Frankenstein. I also, after I read this book, I watched the Hulu Mary Shelley and I really liked that film. So overall, it was such an enjoyable, you know, fall cozy reading experience. Coming in at number seven I have a memoir for you guys and it is called Small Fry by Lisa Brennan Jobs. So this is a memoir about Steve Jobs' daughter who he actually didn't claim um, at first when he kind of rose to fame and it's a memoir told through the perspective of a child who just wants family. She wants the love of her father and she grows up kind of being denied that and she deals with the borderline I would say abuse of her father over the years. She goes through periods where her father denies her the ability to even see her mother or speak to her mother if she wants a family and you just see this girl who has such a complicated background and a complicated relationship with her father over the years it goes from literally when she like before she was born through her entire adult life and all of that and I think it's an interesting read. I think it's a necessary read for like a lot of people because we are all very much impacted by Steve Jobs' inventions. A lot of us use Apple. Like we literally have Apple phones, a lot of us. So I think it's important to know kind of the behind the scenes of all of these inventions, the behind the scenes of this man that we all thought 
law was you know great that was this obviously a revolutionary but also at the same time we it's important to understand that there is a lot more of a complex story behind everything so I just appreciated it for all of those elements I think Lisa is an excellent writer and you really see that narrative throughout the story and it was just overall a very compelling read for me so speaking of memoirs number six is also a memoir that I read this year I'm sure you guys can guess what it is and that is A Promised Land by Barack Obama I listened to this one on audiobook this is actually the copy that I bought for my dad I think that the audiobook route is 100% the route to go for this book because the audiobooks narrated by Obama so it just like becoming it really does sound like you're sitting down and listening to Obama tell his life story because that's really what it is I would say this memoir definitely focused a lot more on the political years the years that he was in the Senate and that he was in the presidency and the behind the scenes of all that so that's really what you're getting you also obviously get a little bit of a background on his you know childhood college all of that but really this is just about his presidency and the politics behind everything that was going on what he wanted and what he still wants from the world and I think that this book gives me a lot of hope and it definitely helped me understand a lot of like the politics that were going on during when he was in the senate and when he was president because at that time I was still kind of growing up and I was just kind of in awe that oh my gosh we have a black president but I didn't really understand like everything and the depth behind you know what's going on so I think it's a great great read I was really fascinated and interested in it and I really really liked it so I definitely think that um, if you're thinking about picking this one up definitely great idea um, I just got it off of audible so coming in at number five is one that I also read kind of towards the end of the year and that is the henna artist uh, wow like this book was excellent it was phenomenal escaping from an abusive marriage 17 year old Lakshmi makes her way alone to the vibrant 1950s pink city of Jaipur which let me just say this book takes place in India and it was so cool having already visited India to be able to picture some of the places that were referenced in the book like I literally went to Jaipur so it was so cool like being able to know and like picture what exactly what I was reading it was so so cool so in the city of Jaipur she becomes this henna artist but not only that she becomes a very highly requested henna artist she becomes super talented all of the rich families essentially go to her because she creates this repertoire that she can not only create these beautiful designs but that her designs can bring people's desires to life and so as she pursues her dream to become kind of an independent woman she is startled one day when she's confronted by her ex-husband her ex-abusive husband who has essentially tracked her down to bring this long lost sister that she never knew about and from there it kind of becomes a story of not only her trying to just like continue building her her life for herself but also she takes into care her her daughter and it's just like there's so many elements about this book that I love this book is so so well written I felt like I could literally picture everything that was happening it felt like kind of like a soap opera the drama that went on in this in this uh, book is like it felt like I was watching a Bollywood film and I think that it also incorporates a really healthy and great discussion of just like gender roles and you know what a woman was expected of and how she like fought against those norms and I was just inspired by how at the end of the day she always kind of put you know her career first and some some people want to do that some people put their career first some people put their family first and both pathways are okay it's even okay to just do a blend of the two so I really like the story and I just got really really consumed and immersed in it and I really wish there was another book like I really would love to see a sequel for this book but I'm pretty sure it's a standalone correct me if otherwise because I would love if I was wrong. So now we are down to our top four. It was really hard for me to rank from here on out. As I said at the beginning, I read so many great books and it was really hard to make this list. I originally started off with 20 books, but then I tried to cut it down to 15. I wanted to do 10, but I really just could not bring it down shorter than 15. So top four. 
I think we're solid. I think this is like my top four. My number four book that I read this year was The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab. It's funny because I right before I read this book I was talking about it in my unpopular book opinions video that I just could never get into V.E. Schwab and I didn't like any of V.E. Schwab's past books and then right as I said that I ate my words up and I read this book and I absolutely loved it. This is kind of like an adult book. I don't even know what genre this is it's kind of like a kind of fantasy historical fiction contemporary blend I don't know I'd, I honestly don't think that we need to put things in a box and put labels on everything anyways so it's 1714 France in a moment of desperation young Addie LaRue or Adelaide LaRue makes a deal with the devil that leaves her cursed to be forgotten by everyone she meets and so the story is told through fra flashbacks of 2014 which is the current present that this book takes place in and the whole 300 years in between as she goes across Europe and through America and she goes experiences life really invisible and it's kind of the story of Addie LaRue trying to figure out how to make a mark on the world when she's virtually and physically and literally invisible it's a story about how you make a mark on the world in general and the purpose of life but it's also the story about art and beauty and how art and beauty can often be immortal and the importance of that and you know the whole muse artist relationship which I, I loved all of those kind of ideas going on in this book and the reason why I love this book so much was because of those ideas and those concepts and because of how unique this book is and the how unique the premise of this book is. I know some people don't like this book and I kind of understand why because I think if you go into the book with a different expectation because I know at first it was kind of marketed as Ad Addie LaRue falls in love with the devil which that's not what it is it's really she makes a deal with the devil and that whole story I think if you look at it from a different angle you may or go into it with different expectations that may change your reading experience for me I just was very invested in Addie LaRue as a character her story her arc how she finally finds purpose in life and how she finally realizes how to make an impact on the world and that whole message that this book really discusses so all right you guys coming in at number three I have educated by Tara Westover I'm gonna have a lot to say about this book because this is like a like a lifetime favorite you guys we're at the lifetime favorites point in this video this is the first book that I read this year which wow I started this year off with a bang let's just say that this was the 2018 Goodreads choice winner so that's why it really originally caught my eye because it was was you know the winner of the Goodreads Choice Awards I'm like okay if this many people read it I should pick it up it took me a long time but I I really what happened was I read this at the end of 2019 but it was kind of on the cusp and I finished reading it in 2020 so I obviously counted it as the first book that I read in 2020 Educated is an autobiography memoir by a woman named Tara Westover. Tara Westover, as she describes it, was 17 years old when she first set foot in a classroom. She was born to this survivalist family that lived in the mountains of Idaho that had the whole idea that they had to prepare for the end of the world. And so she grew up essentially just living for preparing for the end of the world. In the summertime, she stewed herbs with her mom, who was a midwife and a healer. She grew up with her older brothers and in the winter she salvaged in the junkyard with her father where she experienced a lot of dangers and she became injured at many times but her father would not let her see a doctor. He was basically just kind of one of those people that like believes that the government is gonna get you and they need to build and they need to be completely self-sufficient and they need to stay away from any type of government institution which is why she didn't receive a primary education growing up. The family was so isolated from mainstream society that there was no one to really intervene and to like force her to school because that would have been the law at the time. So she really never received any formal education until, until she ended up um, teaching herself and educating herself and then getting herself to the level to where she could take standardized tests and she went to BYU and then she went to Harvard and then she ended up going to Oxford. She's such an incredibly smart woman now and she's written this beautiful book that you know 
really encapsulates her whole entire life experience and her experience with education and I think this book really just it made me understand how important education is, how we can't take it for granted, and I was just so touched by her story. It is one of the most well-written books that I've ever read. It's similar to Glass Castle in those kinds of elements, but I do like it more than Glass Castle. However, I do want to stay away from comparing it to Glass Castle because both books are these women's experiences and their true experiences, their like life experiences, so I don't want to get into like the whole comparing her life experiences experience against another woman's life experience but it is so good it is like one of the best books that I have ever read and I would love to see it adapted into some kind of film some kind of documentary I don't know what the plans for this book is but whatever Tara Westover writes in the future I will 100% be reading it so coming in at number two I have The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett this book was I feel like a pretty popular one this year I just kind of saw it one too many times decided to pick it up and I'm so glad that I did and it's a story Story about these two twin sisters that grow up in a small southern black community in the 1950s 60s they grow up very light skinned so they are white passing and when they're 16 years old they both run away from their mother because they're forced to drop out of high school to essentially clean houses and they want a better life for themselves so they move to this big city I think they mentioned that they moved to New Orleans I believe and they start kind of working and trying to make it out in the world one of the sisters ends up disappearing and basically trying to pass as white and she builds this entire life around herself and there just is this schism between the twin sisters and as we kind of know genetically or just like in general I feel like twins are very very close to one another when they're raised together so it's very difficult because they spend their entire life very very close together they were raised really close together there were like no other siblings in the house and then all of a sudden they're kind of forced to both live their own separate worlds that end up becoming intertwined later on. You kind of go back and forth between them as they're older and when they're younger and the book is kind of told in these stages where they're younger and then they've run away and then they're women who have created their own lives for each other. The one that went ended up passing as white moved to California. She gets a white husband. She has a daughter who believes that she is a hundred percent white and the other twins sister ends up marrying a black man and going back home and both of their daughters end up you know crossing paths and so it is just so 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 interesting and such an incredible discussion it really does kind of crack open systemic oppression against black people in such a unique way it is so good it deserves all the praise and I've heard that it is going to be adapted and I am so excited you guys I am so so excited because this book was incredible it was it was so addicting it was so engaging it was so compelling I, I got so swept up into this the family history and the family drama that I became obsessed so the number one book that I read this year comment down below if you guys think you know what it is I definitely read it very late into the year that some of you guys may not know but I definitely did talk about it in my last college week in my life vlog or one of the last few vlogs that I did this year and that is Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. Wow it's funny because I think I filmed my end of the year book tag and one of the questions on there was like is there a book on your TBR that you think could still surprise you and become your favorite of the year and I said that this one could and it's funny because I bought this book purely on the fact that it is it has been it I've seen it everywhere it's like such a popular book I never really knew what it was about I never had a clear understanding of what the book is about and I don't think you really need one to get into it because it all kind of just really explains itself as you read it but I picked it up anyways because so many people say that this is like one of their favorite books and they talk so highly of it I think it's a book that I see a lot of people reading kind of outside the book community and I don't see as many people in the book community with opinions on it so I didn't really know too much going into it but I gave it the chance and I went into it very skeptical I knew I would probably like it but I knew there was a big chance that I wouldn't and wow this book 
consumed me to say the least. I spent um, about a day and a half reading this book. I stayed up until 2 a.m. Didn't want to put it down. I absolutely flew through this book. I spent like all day reading it and I love that for me. Like that, I just need that like experience like at least once a year for my own sanity. But yeah, this is a debut novel which to me is unfathomable. Where the Crawdads Sing is a coming of age story about a girl named Kaya. She is abandoned basically by her entire family at the start of the novel. It starts off with her mother leaving because her father is abusive towards her mother and she's the youngest of like seven siblings and the sibling that is closest in age to her is already five years older than her. So as soon as the mom leaves they all start to leave her behind until she's alone with her abusive father which is not great. She spends a couple years with him. She learns to survive by basically just like spending time hiding in the woods because they live on this like marsh off of like in the middle of nowhere um, off of this little small town very small town southern judgy vibes prejudice town vibes you know icky town anyway so she really spends most of her time like in the wilderness in the nature she becomes very lonely eventually her father disappears and she spends her life essentially raising herself taking care of herself she goes to school for one day in her life just like educated she ends up having to educate herself and she very much becomes very self-sufficient by herself at a very young age to the point where it is a little bit questionable it is a little bit unrealistic you could say and I would say that would be my only critique of this book abandoned by her family and kind of at such a young age she gets labeled by this small hickey town as the marsh girl so they refer to her as the marsh girl a lot in this book and what this book really does is among other things is explores how isolation really impacts us and I really saw that because she spends literal years without speaking to anyone without interacting with anyone and it takes a toll on her over time so you see that this also book also happens to feature a murder mystery but it's not like the whole point of the book which I kind of like I feel like this book just has like a lot going for it and it has all of these different elements going on really what this book is it's a coming of age story it's a murder mystery it's a courtroom drama it's a love story it's an ode to nature it's just so many of these things it's literally as complex as life itself and I love how all of those elements really just kind of blend into this like story about this girl it sounds kind of weird it sounds like something that wouldn't be my favorite book of all time but just the way that it was executed was so so good there were so many one-liners that like I was like whoo like that was so good I'm gonna read a few because I I just I want to until at last at some unclaimed moment the hearts the heart pain seeped away like water into sand still there but deep Kaya laid her hand upon the breathing wet earth and the marsh became her mother Kaya had to watch a distant string of pelicans study the cloud forms anything but look into dying fish eyes staring at a word world at, at a world without water wide mouth sucking worthless air but what it cost her and what it cost that fish was worth it to have this little shred of family perhaps not for the fish but still let's face it a lot of times love doesn't work out yet even when it fails it connects you to others and in the end that is all you have the connections it has a lot of poetry incorporated poetry that exists and also poetry that she writes herself then she whispered emily dickinson's words the sweeping up the heart and putting love away we shall not want to use again until eternity until eternity i'm sorry you guys but like that's like the writing in this book is so so good uh, apparently delia owen spent years working on this book crafting this story so it's really really worth it delia owens also writes a lot from her experience i watched a couple interviews after this book because i was really interested in her basically her background is that bachelor's of science in zoology from uga and then a phd in animal behavior from uc davis and she spent a lot of time in isolation and that's what she kind of writes about because she lives in like i think was it alaska or wisconsin or something like that she lives in a random state i was watching a video and she like lives by herself in this house like in the middle of nowhere in nature and you see those experiences writing written into this book so there's a lot you can take from this book and for me by the end of it I, I felt so touched by this story that I could not possibly not make it and be my number one for this year and it is most certainly one of my favorite books that I've read of all time as you guys can probably tell I read a lot of really really great books this year that was only my top 15 of 70 books that I read this year I read some really good ones this 
year and I wasn't very much disappointed by a lot of books this year. I know this video was a long one. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe down below. I would love if you would subscribe, join the fam, make sure to hit the notification bell because it's the only way you guys get notified whenever I post. If you stayed up until this point, again, just comment down below what your favorite book of 2020 was and what is the first book you want to read in 2021. I will have a lot of videos on my reading in 2021. Don't worry, we'll be doing plenty of reading vlogs as well, just talking about reading in my college week in my life. So I will be incorporating that. But yeah, happy new year, everyone. I will see you guys in my next video. Bye. Since we have no place to go, let it snow, let it snow.